OMG, guys. This story I'm about to tell you is wild. It's about a hardcore conservative couple who couldn't have children of their own, so they adopted three kids, but ended up returning one after he snuck out. Things didn't end well for the couple because a few years after giving up their one kid but keeping the two others, they were brutally slain. Bob and Kay first met each other in college. He was 35, she was 27. They were both getting their master's degree in education and had a lot of other things in common, including their strict Catholic upbringing. After dating for a while, the couple got married and moved in together. Bob and Kay wanted children of their own, but since Kay was unable to get pregnant, they decided to adopt. The couple was known to have actively participated in pro-life groups, so they believed that by fostering and adopting unwanted children with difficult upbringings, they would be supporting that cause. Apparently, Bob would legit go picketing outside of Planned Parenthood every Saturday with his friends. Also, the idea behind adoption sounds like a super loving and charitable thing to do, but doesn't it seem a bit weird that Bob and Kay were so set on only taking kids in with a specific upbringing? Maybe it was to make them appear a certain way on the outside. So the first kid the Swartzes adopted was a six-year-old boy named Larry. Up until Bob and Kay took him in, Larry had spent his life bouncing around foster homes. Two years later, Bob and Kay added the family again when they decided to foster an eight-year-old boy named Michael. He also had a troubled past like Larry. After initially being given up by his birth mother, Michael had stayed in six foster homes before he came to the Swartzes. So that mean this kid seriously lived in six different homes with six different families in less than eight years? But he finally found his home with Bob and Kay because after fostering Michael for two years, the couple officially adopted him. So it seems like Michael got his happy ending, for now. Larry and Michael were less than a year apart, so they got along well and instantly became BFFs. Now it may seem like Bob and Kay were selfless, loving, and supportive parents, but that wasn't the case behind closed doors. First of all, they were super strict about academics and pressured their sons to get good grades. And when I say pressured, that is an understatement. Like, they were the type of parents that wouldn't just be like, oh, if you don't get all A's, you're grounded for one week. No, when they found out Michael was pretty smart, they made him skip ahead two grades because they thought he wasn't being challenged enough. Aside from the academic aspect, I'm sure the kid had to deal with the trauma of leaving all of his friends and having to meet new people who were two years older than them. Well, Bob and Kay's decision backfired because after they fast-tracked Michael two grades forward, he began acting out. I would act out too if I were him. One time, I ran away from elementary school because my teacher pissed me off, and they didn't even realize until I was gone. Like, I was already out the door, but I didn't really run away. Like, I was just walking home because I was tired and wanted to take a nap. Anyway, at this point, Larry was definitely the favorite child. He's the goody two-shoes who always followed the rules. Michael, on the other hand, was the troublemaker. He was constantly talking back and never listened to his parents. Everything changed for the two boys when Bob and Kay adopted their next child. Two years after Michael was brought in, Bob and Kay adopted a four-year-old girl named Annie who had been abandoned by her birth parents in South Korea. Hmm. A young orphan girl named Annie gets adopted? Never heard of that one before. Annie was the most adorable and sweet little girl, so she quickly became the golden child. Which means Larry was no longer the favorite. Bob and Kay gave their new daughter much more attention than their sons, and they also got a lot stricter on the boys. Larry was able to handle the heat from his parents, but Michael started acting out even more often than before. But what was way worse than a teenage boy with a traumatizing past misbehaving for a pretty valid reason was his adoptive parents' response. Some of the things Bob and Kay did to punish Michael include locking him out of the house and making him stay on the porch all day, grounding him from playing the piano, which he loved playing and was really good at, and one time, Michael let out the air from one of the truck tires and his parents made him pump the tire back up by hand. I have a few questions. Did Bob and Kay give Michael any food when he was sitting out on the porch all day? And did they let him at least use the toilet? What happened to having kids sweep the floors or something as a punishment? Where were we? So Bob and Kay loved their new daughter, Annie, and they were super strict with their two sons, one of which kept fighting back. Michael, the rebellious child, wanted to go hang out with his friends one night. He asked his parents if he could go see them, but they said no. Michael snuck out anyway, but when he got back that night, he had been locked out. He banged on the door and screamed for them to let him in, but no one answered until Kay opened up the window door and told Michael that he was no longer welcome in their home. That is not how parenting works. You can't just unclaim a child if they frustrate you. Well, apparently you can, and that's exactly what Bob and Kay did. So after Michael snuck out that night, his parents really never let him inside. So he ended up sleeping over at his friend's house and going to school by himself the next day. 
While Michael was at school, Bob and Kay called social services to report him as a runaway child. They literally didn't let him in. I cannot with these people. So Bob and Kay told the social worker they couldn't handle Michael and asked for him to be placed with another family. So he went to another house with another family. After he was kicked out by Bob and Kay, Michael continued to act out. He even got into a few fights at school and was sent to a state mental hospital. OMG, this kid can't get a break. Well, it turns out that Larry was actually able to stay in touch with Michael after he got kicked out. The boys would talk on the phone pretty frequently, and most of the time, the topic was Bob and Kay. Larry told Michael how shocked he was that his parents just dropped Michael like that. He said he was worried that his parents would do the same thing to him. He also told Michael how frustrated he was that Bob and Kay didn't like him anymore. They were always giving him the shaft, but worshipped the ground that Annie walked on. And on top of that, he wasn't close with his mom anymore, so both parents became more strict and verbally abusive. So Larry tried everything to get his parents to love him. He even told him that he wanted to become a priest, so they sent him to a seminary school in Pennsylvania, but they ended up sending him back because his grades weren't good, which made the tension between Larry and his parents even worse. They didn't even let him get his driver's license because his grades were so bad. But Larry actually had a learning disability, so it wasn't just him rebelling. He was actually trying really hard to do well. Okay, Bob and Kay are so awful. Why are they so hard on their kids? And you would think they would try different parenting tactics because clearly their approach wasn't working. Larry and his parents fighting just kept getting worse. Bob and Kay often grounded him from everything but school and church. They never let him get his license and didn't even let him hang out with friends. Larry apparently started hiding alcohol in his room to drink at night to help numb the pain. But the Swartz household was about to be flipped upside down. On January 17th, 1984, the police received a disturbing phone call from Larry. He told them his parents had been executed. The police arrived at a gruesome scene. Kay was found lying outside in the snow, and she didn't have any clothes on except for one sock on her foot. She had taken a huge blow to her head and had massive puncture wounds on her neck. Inside the house, they found a chair covered in liquid, and there was a trail of Kay's fluid leading from the chair all the way out to the backyard. Officials believe she was whacked on the chair and tried to run away or was dragged out of the house. Bob's corpse was found in the house inside his office. He had multiple stab wounds and defensive wounds. Investigators continued to search the house, but there were no signs of forced entry and no sign of a blade or any other weapon used to strike Bob and Kay. Then they found a red handprint on the sliding glass door outside right by Kay's body. Since Bob was found in the office, they didn't think it was him, and Kay didn't have any fluid on her hands, so they didn't think it was her either. So investigators thought the handprint must have been from the perp. The search moved to a wooded area past the Swartz's house, where officials found a maul, which is like a hammer or an axe, that was covered in fluid. They also found a series of footprints. Some of them were regular shoe prints, but get this. Another set was from one barefoot and one socked foot. That had to be Kay. So what was she doing over there, and how did she end up in the backyard? Investigators believe that after Kay's initial attack, she tried to escape and was eventually chased by the bad guy until she got the final blow to the head. Then, police interviewed Larry and Annie. Larry said that Annie woke him up that morning because she couldn't find their parents anywhere. He then said he looked out the kitchen window, saw his mother lying in the backyard, and called 911. But in a later interview, Larry said he looked out the dining room window instead of the kitchen window. That's interesting. Larry told officers that he thought it could have been Michael. He said Michael always hated Bob and Kay and even told them his ex-brother once joked about taking a blade to Bob's back. Okay, but how is he so quick to throw Michael under the bus like that? That's a bit sus. But, I mean, Bob and Kay were terrible to Michael, so it would kind of make sense for him to have a lot of pent-up anger towards them. In Annie's interview, she said she heard her father screaming for help the night before. When she looked out the window, she saw a tall man with curly brown hair and a shovel. Why didn't she wake up Larry then? Also, Annie's a bit young to know all of these details. Anyway, the man Annie apparently saw matched Michael's description, so investigators turned to him as a suspect. But Michael was still at the mental hospital at the time and had an alibi. Basically, there was no possible way he could have made it to the Swartzes that night to send his ex-parents to the grave. But Larry's story wasn't so solid. Not only did he switch up the details of how it went down, interviewers also said he was super calm the whole time. For a kid who had just lost his parents, this was unusual. He was also super quick to toss out Michael as a suspect and very well could have convinced Annie to do the same. But what solved the whole crime was the red handprint on the glass door. It was a match for Larry's hand. Oh shit. And just like that, 
Larry was arrested for the demise of his verbally abusive adoptive parents. He confessed and was found guilty on both accounts. But Larry was given a really weird sentence. How do you convict a kid who performed an almost justified act? Larry was served with two 20-year sentences, but they were concurrent instead of consecutive. And Larry ended up getting released after serving only nine years of his sentence. Nine years. After his time in jail, Larry ended up moving in with a random family who heard about his story and wanted to adopt him. Yeah, he was legit adopted by this family at 29 years old. Is that not weird? Larry later moved to Florida, got married, and had a kid before having a heart attack and passing away at 38. Michael went on to rob and execute a man at age 25. He was arrested and sentenced for life. Okay, I am shook over this. Part of me feels bad for Michael because he had such a tough life as a kid. Like, the poor boy bounced around foster homes until he was adopted by a family that returned him, and then he was framed by his ex-brother for executing the parents that didn't want him. But then he does that? Like, how does he not take out his awful parents but went on to ice out someone else? And as for Annie, she ended up moving in with family friends and hasn't performed any criminal life-ending acts that we know of. What a crazy turn of events. I feel like I just watched the R-rated mashup of Matilda, Annie, and the Parent Trap. Who would have guessed that a devout Catholic couple would be smoked by their adopted son? And not even by the adopted son they gave away. That's the end of Bob and Kay's story and this French toast is done, so I think that's my cue to eat it. Thanks for watching.